251 million years ago. The worst mass extinction event planet Earth has ever seen ruined the life of the late Permian period. Known as the Great Dying, this colossal extinction, caused by brutal mass volcanism, wiped out 96% of all marine species and 70% of all terrestrial species. What followed was the Triassic period, which ushered in a whole new era on Earth, the Mesozoic era. In the aftermath of this great disaster, evolution was free to run wild. Huge numbers of species across the world, from arboreal insectivores to huge ambush predators, were now extinct, leaving many different ecological niches to be filled by those who could step up to the challenge of filling them. After the extinction, the world was left with many generalists, species that were efficient at exploiting a wide range of lifestyles and food sources. Some directly survived the extinction and went on to exist throughout the Triassic, whereas some would develop into the strangest group of reptiles the world has ever seen. In this video, we will take you on a tour across the whole Triassic period, focusing not on the dinosaur life, which only evolved towards the end of the period, but on the non-dinosaurian reptiles that filled the seas, forests, and plains. We will take a look at the main areas and continents that these peculiar species called home, where we will meet strange gliding creatures, gigantic marine predators, and the bizarre life forms of the world's coasts and shallows unlike nothing else alive on Earth today. Join us as we depart on a prehistoric safari of the bizarre reptiles of the Triassic period. During the Triassic period, Europe sat on a relatively thin strip of land between Asia to the north and North America to the south. Many of the reptiles that inhabited this coastal island world throughout the Triassic were either marine or semi-aquatic. But life also flourished in the surrounding forests. A typical view on the Italian beaches 230 million years ago would have been nothing like the summer tourist hotspots of the modern day. Along the rocky shores and beaches, would have lived colonies of Tanistrophias, an incredibly slender creature, somewhat resembling a terrestrial plesiosaur superficially. The majority of this creature is its neck, composed of 12 or 13 extremely long vertebrae, which made up about half of the entire animal. In whole, Tanistrophias measured about 6 meters in length, and large colonies of these elongated reptiles gathering on the rocky shores would have been quite the sight. Their necks raised high in the air as they sun themselves in the afternoon heat. These reptiles also had a bizarre method of catching prey. Poorly equipped for a terrestrial lifestyle, this animal would have perched itself on a rocky shoreline, overlooking coastal pools or bays plunging and sweeping its long neck through the water as it picked off fish with long, sharp teeth. The coastal waters of Europe, across the Triassic, played host to a huge number of strange creatures in fact. The Placodots, for example, were a diverse group of marine reptiles, many of which were adapted to eating shellfish and crustaceans which they dive towards the coastal sea floor to obtain. Placodus is the most well-known, a strange beaked creature, perfectly designed for crushing the hard shells of its prey. Some of them, however, were even stranger. Henodus was a placodot which looked like a modern-day sea turtle, although the two are not related. Henodus had a flat, circular shell, which stretched out across its entire body, 
and possess the same flat, crushing beak of its relatives. These shells would have made effective defenses against some of the Triassic Sea's more dangerous residents, such as sharks and ichthyosaurs. True turtles, meanwhile, were also present in Triassic Europe. Proganochelys was an early turtle species that would have inhabited freshwater systems, resembling a basal tortoise with a jagged shell and spiny neck and head. Elsewhere, in the waters of Triassic Europe, stranger creatures were still surfing through the waves. Also superficially resembling a plesiosaur was Dactylosaurus, a very early member of a group called Pachypleurosaurus. This was the most basal or primitive member of this group and resembled a plesiosaur with distinct fingers on its front limbs. More familiar groups of reptiles inhabited these seas too, 235 million years ago. In the waters that now surround Greenland and Iceland, lived an ichthyosaur named Gripia, which looked almost like one of the great Cretaceous mosasaurs of the western interior seaway, only a small fraction of the size and completely unrelated. Fully aquatic, these little predators were adapted to a coastal lifestyle, picking off fish and small reptiles in the surf. This little ichthyosaur was likely a generalist, relying upon many different food sources to survive and thrive, taking everything from fish and reptiles to crustaceans and mollusks. As we mentioned earlier, forest habitats thrived around the coastal islands and ismuses, in them lived a huge variety of reptiles, some of which were by far the strangest seen in Europe across the Triassic period. Take Ozimek, for example, a Polish species of gliding reptile which would have thrived in these forests. With a thin layer of skin stretching between its limbs, these little gliders would have been adept at drifting from treetop to treetop their slender forms blending in with the twigs and branches of the vegetation as they caught little insects in flight. These reptiles are characterized by their incredibly long, slender limbs, almost insect-like in proportion. It would have lived in relative safety amongst the treetops, out of reach of the numerous dangerous archosaurs and amphibians that lived below. Traveling back to Italy now, we encounter perhaps the single strangest creature of Triassic Europe, Drapanosaurus. This was an arboreal climbing reptile, suited to the lifestyle of a pangolin or tamandua, peculiar insectivorous mammals of Asia and South America respectively. With a thick prehensile tail, it would have been able to firmly root itself to branches to avoid falling, as it picked insects out of the trees with its long, curved claws. It looked similar to a chameleon in life, with a curved, ridged back and unique tail, which acted like a fifth limb for the reptile to cling on to its treetop environment. Drapanosaurus may have occasionally made trips to the ground, to exploit insect food sources hiding within the soil or forest floor detritus. Leaving the forests and heading out towards the floodplains and open land that covered the fringes of the towering woodlands, we encounter other unique and peculiar European Triassic reptiles. Hyperodapodon, a type of rhynchosaur, lived in what would one day become Scotland towards the end of the Triassic period. It was a small, unobtrusive animal, which would have spent a lot of time skulking around vegetation or riverbanks. It was the rodent of its day, and actually resembled something between a reptile and a rat, with its huge, curved incisor teeth, used for digging up and picking at roots and tubers. The head of the animal resembled that of no reptile living today and looked uncannily mammal-like 
with its flat, rounded structure. It was roughly the size of a small dog. Back in Italy, some of the first pterosaurs were beginning to conquer these habitats. Taking to the skies to pick off the flying insects of the warm climate was Patinosaurus, one of the very first of its kind, living towards the end of the Triassic period. With a tiny wingspan of about 60 centimeters, creatures like little Patinosaurus would go on to rule the skies for the remainder of the Mesozoic, starting off one of the largest and most iconic animal legacies in all of prehistory. The diversity experienced in North America for the reptiles of the Triassic was truly astounding. Some of the very largest and the very smallest reptiles of the period lived in North America at this time and almost every form and shape of creature in between could have been found across this vast continent throughout the weird and wonderful Triassic. Looking out to the sea, colossal shapes may occasionally be visible, shadows forming into huge bulging forms. A three meter head breaking the surface of the water perhaps with a cephalopod in its mouth, if you're especially lucky. These giants are Shastasaurus, a species of 21-meter-long ichthyosaur, which feeds in the shallow seas surrounding the islands and coasts of the continent, the largest marine reptiles to ever live. It is theorized that Shastasaurus may have used its gaping jaws like a vacuum, creating huge pressure differences in the water as it opened its jaws so wide and so fast. Ichthyosaurs were the dominant marine reptiles of North America throughout the Triassic and took on many shapes and sizes. Much closer to the shallow seas that clung to the shorelines lived Symbospondylus, an ichthyosaur that specialized in hunting smaller fish and cephalopods that relied on the shorelines. Lacking dorsal fins, these creatures are a far cry from the stereotypical ichthyosaur form we associate with the likes of Ichthyosaurus or Ophthalmosaurus of the Jurassic, but were basal ancestors to the creatures that would arrive in the coming millions of years. Despite the gargantuan sizes of Shastasaurus, Symbospondylus was still a very large ichthyosaur for the time and would have been a formidable predator along the ancient American coastlines. The ichthyosaurs were not alone in these early American seas, however. Other pachypleurosaurs, similar to the dactylosaurus we encountered in Europe, were common in and along the coastline and had begun to swiftly colonize these early seas. Corosaurus was one of them, a slender, seal-like reptile that was perfectly adapted to a lifestyle as a marine piscivore. Streamlined and sleek, groups of Corosaurus would likely have been a common sight along the beaches and rocky coasts of North America. Perhaps sluggish and slow on land, they would have been aquatic acrobats in the water, wheeling and circling around shoals of fish before darting in and out to feed. Tanny Trachylos was another American coastal resident, a reptile of bizarre proportions. Slender and lizard-like in form, this creature's hind limbs were hypertrophied to huge proportions, aiding it in paddling and diving through the water to dive for food. Moving towards the land now, we can witness something very similar to what we saw in Europe. The creatures of the surrounding forests were the true stars of the American Triassic, some of the strangest of the entire Triassic period. At the very tops of the trees lived the mysterious Hyperonectar, 
a species of drapanosaur related to the European drapanosaurus. This was without a doubt the strangest of the drapanosaurus, which were already a very strange bunch indeed. It has been the subject of much debate over the years as to how it lived its life. Again, very similar to a pangolin or to mandua, Hypronectar possessed a huge sail-like tail, which would have looked much like a large leaf in life. Several depictions of the creature show it as a gliding reptile with a thick layer of skin, otherwise known as batagium, stretching from limb to limb, used for quick and efficient travel between the tops of the trees. It has even been proposed that Hypronectar was an aquatic drapanosaur, due to the fact that some remains have been found in the bottom sediment of an ancient Triassic lake, and the incomplete specimens make it a hard animal to recreate. The fact that the large tail was delicate and lacked sufficient musculature, however, point to the fact that this was probably an arboreal drapanosaur, which fell into the lake or was perhaps dragged in by a predator. Depictions of hyperonectar as a glider are speculative, but it's a wonderful thought to imagine these bizarre reptiles gliding through the trees of the Triassic forests of America over 200 million years ago. On the murky forest floors that would one day become Texas lived another Triassic oddball Trioptichus was a lizard-like archosauriform, distantly related to dinosaurs, crocodilians, and birds. It is only known from a fraction of a skull, which features five bony plates, which were likely used for interspecific combat, similar to the headbutting displays found in modern-day bighorn rams, or the famous Cretaceous dinosaur, Pachycephalosaurus. Weirder still, there is a deep pit in the bone at the back of its skull, which looks almost like another eye socket. It is possible that this was a parietal eye, a structure found in some modern-day reptiles, such as tuataras and some lizards. This eye, if indeed it was the purpose of the dent, could not see but was instead likely used in sensing predators and changes in the environment. Heading down to the great continent that would one day support the mighty Amazon rainforest and pompous grasslands, a whole new host of bizarre reptiles can be encountered. This is the land where archosaurs are dominant early predecessors to the crocodilians, dinosaurs, and ultimately birds. These creatures evolved into many bizarre shapes and forms. From unrecognizable, alien-like reptiles, to more familiar species, much more closely resembling their crocodile relatives. Throughout much of the Triassic, South America was an arid, dry land dominated largely by scrubland, deserts, and the occasional floodplain or river basin. Towards the end of the Triassic, as the continent shifted, a tropical belt was present through the middle of the land, and a variety of strange reptiles developed as a result. South America's star reptiles throughout the Triassic were the archosaurs, that were best suited to a lifestyle of wandering this arid landscape. Slender, agile creatures that could swiftly dart across the sands and rocks. Marasuchus is a great example of one of these creatures. It was a dinosauriform archosaur. Not quite a dinosaur, but closely related. It looked something like a kangaroo in a dinosaur's clothing. Long, slender legs that would allow it to deftly leap through its open environment. Marasuchus has even been depicted in the past as having early feather-like filaments coating its body, reminiscent of its future theropod cousins. 
even more closely related to dinosaurs, were the Silosaurids, a group of archosaurs which resembled slender quadrupedal theropods. They were herbivorous and were likely suited to a life out in the riverine scrubland in great herds. South America had an archetypal representative in Ignatosaurus, a creature which would have been extremely common in Argentina 231 million years ago. This medium-sized archosaur would have shared the land with some of the earliest dinosaurs, perhaps competing for food sources or being preyed upon by them. One of the strangest archosaurs to inhabit South America in the Triassic was the bizarre Lagosuchus, a creature closely related to Marasuchus. This was a little crocodile-like creature, again very slender in form, and one that may have possessed little feather-like filaments across its body, perhaps for display or to keep it warm. It was a transitional animal between the cold-blooded bodies of the earliest reptiles and the warm-blooded bodies of the earliest dinosaurs, one of the first known examples of such a creature. Traveling to the expansive continent of Africa now, the part of the world which clings on to the last examples of mammalian megafauna, in the elephants, giraffes, and rhinoceroses of the savannas. Today, Africa is a continent which displays iconic diversity in its animal life, and in the Triassic, things were no different. Reptiles had begun to conquer the seas and the lands, resulting in some of the most outlandish animals the world has ever seen. Africa is most famous for its reptilian predators in the Triassic. A huge display of diversity was present in this vast land. Erythrosuchus was one of the most formidable predators of the Triassic. At five meters in length, this creature was related to archosaurs and is known from several specimens. What makes this predator stand out is its gargantuan skull. At a meter long, this creature's jaws were truly colossal. A giant apex predator, easily capable of bringing down large herbivorous therapsids that it shared the African plains with. While Erythrosuchus dominated terrestrial Africa, another archosaur lurked in the river systems and lakes that were present across the land. Proterosuchus, a crocodile-like creature, capable of growing to over three meters in length, hunted much like a modern-day crocodile, waiting for therapsid herbivores, such as the little Lystrosaurus, to wander down to the waterside to drink pulling them to their doom at the depths of the murky water, like a Nile crocodile after a wildebeest. Not all of Africa's reptiles were monstrous carnivores throughout the Triassic, however. And one of the most remarkable little reptiles that walked the land in the Triassic was Mesosuchus. About 30 centimeters in length, from nose to tail tip, this was a tiny little rhynchosaur, related to the European Hyperodapodon. It is a very basal version of some of the later rhynchosaurs that would evolve and would have been a common sight in the forests and woodlands of Triassic Africa about 245 million years ago. the two most southerly continents of planet Earth, Oceania and Antarctica, were closely joined together during the Triassic at the bottom of Gondwana. The hot deserts and icy wastes that dominate the landscape of much of these continents in the modern day were very different in the Triassic, and vast swaths of land across both of the continents were covered in warm, temperate plains and forests. 
a wide variety of creatures had evolved after the great dying to take the place of those that were wiped out. And evolution had thrown up surprising forms and functions in the wake of the massive disaster. Procolophon, for example, was a little para-reptile that actually directly survived the extinction event and thrived throughout the early Triassic period, going extinct around the beginning of the middle of the period. Only 30 centimeters in length, Procolophon was a diminutive woodland herbivore, which is likely to have supplemented this diet with insects or other invertebrates. What makes this creature peculiar is its head. It was almost ceratopsian-like in appearance, bearing what looked like a superficial beak and large eyes, which has led scientists to believe it was adept at catching nocturnal insects throughout the small hours. It would have looked similar to a modern-day thorny devil or armadillo lizard, with several spike-like protrusions projecting from the face. These may have been used for display or combat, but it is possible that they were attachment points for huge muscles on the reptile's jaw. Moving over to Australia, Tasmaniosaurus was a carnivore that patrolled what would one day become Tasmania in the early Triassic. It was a very strange-looking reptile indeed. It was presumably lizard-like, relatively small, with a long snout used for snapping up small vertebrates, such as reptiles and perhaps fish. Closely related was the Australian Collisuchus, discovered in Queensland in the 1970s. It likely had a downturned snout, adapted for a similar diet, and measured about 3 meters in length. The final stop on our tour is by far the strangest, the wild, vast land of Asia. In the Triassic period, Asia was a land of many extremes and varying environments. Siberia, to the north, was actually warm and temperate for the majority of the Triassic, with smaller swaths of tropical boreal forest present towards the end of the period. To the south was a gigantic archipelago of tropical islands, similar to the layout of modern-day Southeast Asia. Some of the more northern islands were arid, composed of deserts and scrublands, similar to those found in South America. A vast number of habitats allow a vast number of species to develop in them, and that was just the case across Asia and the Triassic. Throughout the period, Asia was home to the weirdest reptiles that have ever evolved. 220 million years ago, in what is now southwest China, the coastal archipelagos harbored large numbers of Odontocallus, a member of a group of animals closely related to modern-day turtles, although it was not a turtle itself. This was a bulky reptile, with a body resembling that of a turtle without a shell. As such, there have been several hypotheses put forward as to how this strange reptile lived its life. Did it swim in marine environments like modern sea turtles? Was it semi-aquatic? Or was it entirely confined to land? Although the general form of a turtle was present in Odontocallus, its hands were very different. And although the fossils were discovered in marine deposits, they looked very ill-suited for a marine animal. The jury is still out on this species, but hopefully more discoveries will be made soon that can shed some light on the case. Another strange Chinese species of marine reptile was Zinpusaurus, a type of Thalatosaur. These marine reptiles were well adapted to diving down to the rocky sea floor 
like modern-day marine iguanas. Zinbusaurus was a particularly strange specimen, in the sense that it possessed a trunk-like structure at the front of the snout, likely used for probing the sea floor for invertebrates and other food sources. The most famous and prominent of the Pachypleurosaurs was also present in Asia in the Triassic, Nothosaurus. This creature lived like a modern-day seal, only it was much more crocodile-like in form and structure. These marine predators boasted sharp, interlocking needle-like teeth, used for ensnaring and trapping coastal fish that provided it with sustenance. It would not have been an uncommon sight to see large groups of Nothosaurus gathered in colonies on the beaches and shores, large numbers of strange marine reptiles filling the ecological niches of mammalian aquatic carnivores in the modern day. Perhaps the strangest reptile of all, Atopo dentatus, was another creature that haunted the shores of China in the early and middle Triassic period. This creature's mouth has been the cause of a lot of scientific debate over the years since its initial description in 2014. Early artist impressions of the Nothosaurus-like reptile showed it with a seemingly impossible facial structure, a vertically split zipper-like structure which ran upwards from the main jaw. This was proved in 2016, however, to be as impossible as it looked. But the truth isn't much less familiar than fiction. In reality, a topo dentatus had a snout shaped much like the head of a hammerhead shark, a wide, duck-like bill that was used for combing and rooting across the sediment of the seabed for food. To this day, it remains one of the biggest flagship creatures for the true otherworldliness of the Triassic period's reptiles. A close relative of Europe's Tanistrophius also took up residence in Asia's coastal realms. Dinocephalosaurus was much smaller than its relative, at 3 meters in length, and this animal's lifestyle also set it apart. Dinocephalosaurus, despite possessing the similar long neck of Tanistrophius, was a diver. This creature is proposed to have leapt into the water, pushed along by specialized limbs to help it swim as it pursued fish, diving straight into shoals and picking off individuals with ease with its long, tapering neck. Ichthyosaurs were also a common sight along the coasts of Asia in the Triassic, both in and out of the water, surprisingly. Cartorhynchus was a tiny, basal ichthyosaur that was actually semi-aquatic, this little piscivore was able to pull itself out onto land for extended periods of time, perhaps to breed or to sleep. Measuring only 30 centimeters long, this little creature bore almost no resemblance to the classic ichthyosaur image. But it would spearhead a lineage of iconic marine reptiles that would persist for millions of years. Similar, but not related to ichthyosaurs, was one of the strangest creatures in the waters of Triassic Asia, Nonchangosaurus. About a meter in length, it picked off small fish from the coastal waters of China's Middle Triassic, propelled through the water with rubber-like limbs. To make matters even stranger, Nonchangosaurus was armored, with bony plates running along its back, to protect it from larger reptiles and fish of the region. On land, the wildlife was even stranger. Asia was home to a variety of small tropical reptiles, utterly bizarre in form. Longisquama was a tropical forest dweller, native to what would one day become Kyrgyzstan, and would have been an unobtrusive, unremarkable little reptile 
were it not for the row of proportionally massive finger-like appendages running down its back. It is unknown to this day just what Longasquama used these appendages for, a mystery that has persisted for over 50 years following its discovery. Two main theories are in circulation. Either Longasquama used these features to glide from treetop to treetop, perhaps to find food or escape predators, or it used them for display purposes, either to intimidate a rival or win a mate. In depictions of the latter, the appendages are brightly colored, almost like that of a tropical bird, which could have made for some amazing sights in the dense green jungles of Asia all those millions of years ago. Perhaps even stranger was Charovipteryx, a gliding reptile that made the most of a very unusual form of locomotion. Instead of possessing a typical stretch of loose skin or patagium, which would usually run from its forelimbs to its hind limbs, Charovipteryx possessed skin flaps only on its legs, which ran from its feet to the base of its tail. It would have combined this with rapid, violent flaps of its tail to encourage drag as it leapt from treetop to treetop. Nothing like this has evolved in nature since Charo Victorix soared through the Triassic canopy. Meanwhile, in India, one of the most remarkable reptiles ever to live was ambling through the forest undergrowth, browsing on the dense vegetation of the forests and scrublands. At almost four meters in length, Shringosaurus was one of the largest herbivores of its time. With its long neck and tail, it may have even superficially resembled a small sauropod, one of the large long-necked dinosaurs of the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. What made Tringosaurus even more spectacular was its horns. Two sharp forward-facing horns protruded from the top of its head, almost looking like an incredibly thick version of an insect's antennae. These horns would have been used primarily for display or in combat with rival males. A strike or blow from a Shringosaurus horn with the might of an animal this size behind it would have been enough to severely damage a rival or attacker. Shringosaurus, despite its sauropod-like appearance, would have actually much more closely resembled a modern-day lizard in gait and body shape. Walking with a sprawled stance, its limbs splayed out to each side of its massive body. We have now reached the end of this tour through time and space, across the strange world of the reptiles of the Triassic. Many, many more species of bizarre and spectacular reptile existed and thrived throughout this period, and the ones we have covered today are really only scratching the surface. We encourage you to do some reading around the topic, as it really is one of the most spectacular and otherworldly times in history, full of creatures nothing like anything else on Earth today.